Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Lavers and I'm recording this lecture from Hobart, Tasmania in Southern Australia. I'm a lecturer in marine science at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. And I'm thrilled to be joining you today at the Challenge for Climate Conference. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this event. I'm gonna to talk to you about the consequences of plastic exposure, in particular ingestion when animals ingest plastic in wildlife, especially seabirds, because that's my main area of research and study. So let's get started. I'm sharing my screen with you. So if I press this button and give it a moment, hopefully my first slide is popped up on the screen. You can see my photo. Okay. So normally I would begin a talk like this with a brief history of when our addiction to plastic began, how plastic gets into the ocean. But today I'm actually gonna skip most of that because plastics have been in the media for many, many years now. And many of us know the basics and how important this issue really is. So instead, I wanna show you this photo of the night sky over Hobart, Tasmania, where I live and where I'm talking to you from now. You might be thinking, why in the world is there a photo of Hobart in a presentation about plastic? Well, the Milky Way is home to an estimated 10 billion stars. Current estimates suggest there are around 5 trillion pieces of plastic floating in just the top 10 centimeters of the world's oceans. So what does that mean? Well, the ocean therefore has around, give or take, 50 times more plastic at present than there are stars in the Milky Way. That's a pretty overwhelming statistic. So why did I show you that photo of the Milky Way? Well, plastic has been recently recognized as one of the key environmental pressures facing our planet. This is due, of course, in large part to significant accumulations on remote islands, like the photo I'm showing you here. Henderson Island is one of the islands that I work on, but also accumulations at the bottom of the ocean, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, virtually anywhere we look now. Huge densities of this plastic mean that the numbers become so vast, they can be really difficult for people to comprehend, just you know, really any of us, it's the numbers are just so huge. There's billions over here, maybe trillions in the ocean, you know, millions of seabirds dying. This is really what we call big data. And this is something any of the students participating in the Datathon challenge will be dealing with. Big data and how to grapple and wrap your minds around it. And what I find in my job as a scientist and a science communicator is that analogies like the Milky Way can help put the scale of this issue into some kind of perspective. It helps people relate. So what is it exactly about this plastic other than it looking unattractive on our beaches what is it actually about the plastic that makes these particles so dangerous to wildlife and to the environment more broadly? Well, a suite of chemical additives are incorporated actually into the plastics at the time of manufacture. Why is this done? Well, because we want our plastics to have very specific properties. We want to enhance their performance. We want to make them maybe more colorful, fire resistant, we want the plastic to be flexible, or we want it to last longer. Unfortunately, in most instances, our understanding of what these chemicals later do to the environment or to our wildlife when those particles are ingested is exceptionally poor. Very few data exist. However, we do know a few things. So let me walk you through this. First, what we know is as plastics degrade, if we look at this bottom panel that's just popped up on your screen, the surface becomes more porous. It becomes more kind of old and degraded and textured. And you can see that moving from left to right. We've got a new pellet on the left and an old pellet on the right. And you can see it's quite textured. 
This increases the surface area or the absorptive capacity of those particles. So older plastics floating in the ocean have the capacity to absorb more chemicals. This middle panel that's gonna pop up here in a second, this is a little bit complicated, but it's actually kind of exciting, at least for me as a scientist. What it means is older plastics can absorb and become more tox toxic. And so what you can see on these colorful panels is the panel on the left is actually a slice through a bottle cap. Can you see those little rippled edges? That's actually the inside of the bottle cap. This particular bottle cap was swallowed by a seabird. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is See how along the edges of the bottle cap, they're discolored, they're kind of orangish brown. What that tells us is that the chemicals are absorbed mostly on the surface of the plastic, not in the middle on the core, but only on the edges. That makes sense, right? Because it's those edges of the plastic bottle cap that were exposed to the ocean and could pick up all of the chemicals floating in the ocean and kind of suck it up onto the surface. Now, if we look at this last panel that's gonna pop up, this is the key question that me as a scientist and my colleagues are trying to answer is, when those plastics are later ingested by a bird, a fish, a whale, what happens when those plastics are exposed to things like digestive enzymes in your stomach? Do those chemicals on the surface of that bottle cap leach into the bloodstream or the tissues of that animal? That's a good question. So over the last 20 years, my research team has been studying seabird ecology on Lord Howe Island. Two species in particular, which you can see on the right, the flesh-footed shearwater, which we've coded FFSH, and the wedge-tailed shearwater, which is covered in fluffy down, which is WTSH. Now, the reason why we've picked seabirds and these two species is because seabirds are widely regarded around the world as sentinel species or indicators of ocean health. As scientists, we monitor the birds closely and if their populations are doing well, if they're healthy, they're breeding, we, we make an assumption that so are all the species below them in the food web, the fish and the squid and, and everything else. Unfortunately, seabird populations are actually declining faster than any other bird group. So the message our sentinels, the seabirds, are telling us is that something is actually wrong. But what is it? What is this message? So here's some of the monitoring we've been doing on Lord Howe Island. You can see, I'll let that pop up on the screen that the proportion of these two species of seabird ingesting plastic, so the number of birds accidentally consuming plastic on this island has been going up fairly consistently over the last 10, 20 years or so. I'm just showing you some of the data here. And that's worrying because it does suggest that the amount of plastic in the ocean around this island and where the birds live must also be going up. The record holder for this species was a whopping 276 pieces of plastic weighing 64 grams. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually when we convert it into human terms. So the plastic was 15% of that, that bird's body mass. And if we convert that into human terms and you kind of figure out what you weigh and what I weigh, give or take, that's around eight maybe 10 kilos of plastic. So imagine having to play a soccer game, go to the grocery store, walk to school, having eight kilos of plastic in your stomach. You know, that would make a really significant impact on how you live your day-to-day -day life. And that's the challenge that these birds face. So, these are some worrying statistics, but the other main question that I work on, my team studies, is what is all this plastic actually doing to our birds and to other marine wildlife? So over the next couple of slides, you'll see in the top left corner, they're numbered one, two, and three. I'm gonna walk you through some of our results. 
Now, logically, logically, I'm going to start kind of with the more basic one. So let's look at body condition or overall health. Now, don't worry, these plots look a little bit confusing at the start, but I'm actually going to try and walk you through them as best I can. So in 2014, one of the first studies that we reported was we found that ingested plastic, so when a bird accidentally consumes plastic, that it negatively impacts a number of important metrics that we use as scientists to measure bird health and condition. On the left-hand panel, let me just pop up my animation there. There you go, you can see, we looked at body mass. And what we found, if you look at that downward sloping line, is that body mass was especially poor in birds that had just ingested plastic. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. The more plastic you've got rolling around in your stomach, probably the less space you have for fish and squid and other things you should be eating. And so your body mass, your health and your condition is going to decline. The right-hand panel is very similar. And what we looked at there was beak length or kind of the size of the head and, and the mouth. And we found that that also declined, that went down. The more plastic you've eaten, kind of the smaller some of the other measurements can be. You have a smaller head, you have a smaller mouth. So what does that actually mean for these birds? Well, when the young birds are accidentally fed plastic by the adults, this reduces their overall growth, health, and condition. They have smaller wings, they have lower body mass, they have smaller beaks. And this almost certainly influences the ability of these young birds to fly and catch prey. And so the effects of the plastic are not just over a couple of days, weeks, or months, but are actually likely to be much longer lasting, meaning these birds are unlikely to survive their first critical year at sea, and we probably won't ever see them again. There's my, sorry, my last animation. Okay, let's see, number two, what else does ingested plastic do? We call these sublethal effects. So another part of our long-term study of these seabirds is to look at uh, collecting tissues from the birds. So in this particular case, we were looking at exposure to the chemicals, which I mentioned before. Uh, and for this study, we looked at the feathers and something we call trace elements or metals, things like mercury, arsenic, um, some pretty scary stuff sometimes. I'm just going to talk about a couple of our results. So what we found is that the birds had quite elevated um, uh, metals when they ingested plastic. So once again, no big surprise, the more plastic you have in your stomach, the more metals you have in your tissues. In particular, we found quite elevated uh, mercury and that very few birds fell below this critical threshold. What that meant is most birds on Lord Howe Island are above the threshold, meaning we are concerned that they may have other sublethal effects such as neurological issues, which might impair their ability to migrate, for example. They could have cancers or infertilities or other things that are going on. Uh, and finally, this is really important because it's linked with uh, some of these metals and other chemicals are actually found in household plastics and many of the particles that we actually detect in the birds. So it's not particularly surprising that the more plastic you find in the birds, you do find those chemicals in them as well. Okay, and third and finally to wrap us up, so many of these interactions that I've already started to talk about with debris are, are clearly resulting in less visible sublethal effects. And this is concerning because birds can compensate for some of these physiological impairments caused by this disease. Meaning for me as a scientist, it's really challenging because when I go out to the island, the birds are actually still alive. They're walking around, they're flapping their wings. They can appear healthy, but they're actually not. 
This can mislead scientists into thinking that the birds are of apparent health and condition. And it means that overall, potentially worldwide, we are underestimating the true impact of plastic simply because wildlife is so good at kind of hiding the amount of suffering that's going on. So recently, this got me thinking. As a human, if I'm unwell, I go to my doctor, point to exactly where it hurts, and I explain my symptoms. But for a bird or other wildlife, this simply isn't possible. As scientists, we don't know where and how they're suffering. But we do have access to a range of tools that medical doctors use, which we could potentially apply to wildlife studies to better understand this. So why not apply them to seabirds? And this is exactly what my team did in 2017. We collected blood samples, much like you might have done when you go to see your doctor, and sent them to a lab that specializes in diagnosing health conditions. We treated basically the birds like any human patient that walked into a clinic or a hospital. We had no idea what was wrong with them. So we screened the bird's blood using common tests and looked at a whole range of parameters. I've named a bunch on the screen there. You don't, you don't need to know what they are. They're just very common parameters that we look for. So what did we discover? Well, we figured that plastic had a significant negative impact on a couple of really important things. So when you have plastic in your stomach, it impacted things like uric acid and amylase. Don't get too worried with these very technical um, parameters like uric acid and amylase. What you need to know is that they are associated with kidney disease. And so what this suggests to us is that ingested plastic is starting to interfere with kidney function, potentially also liver function as well. This last one was particularly interesting to us. This showed us that the results for cholesterol are essentially an all or nothing result, that ingestion of even one piece of plastic might actually be significant to elevate levels of cholesterol and essentially tip birds over a threshold where they start to be negatively impacted by plastic. That's important because worldwide right now, scientists are really unclear where that threshold is. Does a, a bird, a whale, a dolphin, do they have to ingest one piece of plastic, five, 10? Where is that threshold where bad things start to happen? And until now, we kind of didn't know. This suggests that one piece might just be enough. This was a huge lesson for us. And I hope some of these take home messages have resonated with you. Once again, I want to extend a big thank you. Good science happens because of good people. Good luck with your data-thon. Good luck with the conference. You're definitely part of this conversation. Thank you.